Welcome friends, I'm Dr. Rajshrina Budrapad and today's video is all about what I learned from wearing a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks. So this is a tool that I often recommend to my patients to figure out how to improve their metabolic health. So I decided to try it myself to really understand how it works. And what I discovered was absolutely amazing. So today I'm gonna to share 10 lessons that I learned from my continuous glucose monitor, also known as a CGM. First, let me explain how a CGM works. So a CGM has a sensor that goes on the back of your arm and a microfilament enters your skin and sits in the interstitium of your fat. From there, it can detect glucose molecules that leak out from the capillaries into the interstitium. So that's how it detects your blood glucose. So it continuously records your blood glucose and sends the data to your iPhone using Bluetooth. So you can see a graph of your blood glucose 24 seven. So this means you can find out exactly how specific foods affect you. Also, what happens to your glucose when you're stressed or when you're exercising or what happens when you're fasting? This is vital information that can help change the course of your metabolic health because what gets measured gets managed. So knowing your blood glucose 24 seven in real time can make a huge difference. Right now, half of the adults in the United States have insulin resistance and a third have fatty liver disease and prediabetes and diabetes are on the rise. The great news is that all of these conditions are generally reversible through diet and lifestyle. And that's where a CGM can give you the real time data to change the course of your health. So I did an experiment and decided to try it myself. A little background on my health, so I don't have insulin resistance, but I am someone who needs to eat their meals at regular times, otherwise I could feel tired and weak. So I thought it would be interesting to find out what's happening with my blood glucose when I feel this way. So a CGM can also be a really helpful tool for anyone with unstable blood glucose or anyone with hypoglycemia, which is low blood glucose. So I use the Lingo CGM, which is available on their website direct to consumer, even without a doctor's prescription. And it's pretty affordable. So a two week sensor was under $50, but currently it's only compatible with an iPhone. So the sensor application was really easy. So you just disinfect the back of your arm with alcohol and then push down the sensor with the applicator. So it's designed for self-application, but I actually had my husband push it down because I admit I was a little nervous, but I'm happy to report that I was actually pleasantly surprised. When he pushed it down, I hardly felt it at all. And for the next two days, I just noticed it a little bit when I would move my arm or when I was sleeping on that side, but there was absolutely no pain. So the sensor lasts on your arm for two weeks, so you can even shower with it. So it has a pretty strong adhesive, so you really don't have to worry about it for two weeks. So after the two weeks, I took off the sensor and I saved it so I could show it to you all. So this is what the sensor looks like. And I'll put a paper behind it so you can really see the tiny microfilament. So it's really, really tiny, you can hardly see it. It's not a hard needle. It's super tiny, flexible microfilament that enters your skin. So you really hardly feel it at all. So the CGM will graph out your glucose all the time. And the healthy range is between 70 and 140. So I noticed that my fasting glucose and my glucose most of the day was in the 80s. And then after I would eat, I'd have a rise in glucose that would peak about 30 minutes to an hour after the meal. And the peak in the glucose could be anywhere from 110 to 190, depending on what I ate. Now you might be wondering, isn't it normal for your glucose to go up after you eat something? Well, yes, but the reason we want to avoid big glucose spikes is it can lead to a process called glycation, where sugar is linked to proteins. So this is actually how we're able to measure your hemoglobin A1C, which is actually a measure of glycated hemoglobin in your blood, meaning how much sugar has become attached to the hemoglobin molecules in your red blood cells. And it's an indicator of your blood glucose over the last three months. But glycation can have harmful effects on the body. You may have heard the term advanced glycation end products, also known as AGEs. So these will actually age you both on the inside and outside. For example, glycation can actually accelerate the aging process of the skin on your face, leading to the breakdown of collagen, which causes wrinkles. It can also age the inside of your body, both the blood vessels as well as the internal organs. High sugar levels and AGEs are bad for your brain, heart, eyes, 
kidneys, and nerves. And this is why diabetics are at risk of damage to all of these organs if their blood sugar is not controlled. Additionally, when your blood glucose spikes, your body releases more insulin from the pancreas, and insulin tells your cells to store fat. Also, higher insulin levels drive more hunger. So the key to losing weight is to really avoid spiking your blood glucose. So here's a summary of the benefits of not spiking your blood glucose. You'll prevent glycation, which is the aging process of your skin and internal organs. You'll prevent fat storage and allow your body to use more of the fat that you already have for energy. You'll promote stable energy, stable mood, and stable focus. So now let's dive into the 10 lessons I learned from my CGM experience. Lesson number one is that stress can raise your blood glucose, even without food. We all know that food raises blood glucose, but did you know that stress can do so as well? So one evening, I was just relaxing at home. It was about two hours after dinner, and then my son and husband come back from baseball practice, and I found out that my husband actually got hit by a baseball and had a big bruise on his leg. So when I saw the bruise, I immediately felt really stressed, and I saw my blood glucose numbers going straight up. So they went from the 80s to 120s, even without any food. They subsequently went up higher to the 140s because I did have a little sweet potato as a bedtime snack, but that initial rise in blood glucose was without any food at all. It was just from the stress. So my body was reacting and producing more adrenaline and cortisol, which drove up the blood sugar. So when you're in a state of fight or flight, your body has an adaptive mechanism to raise your blood sugar, to give you more energy to handle the stressful situation. Lesson number two is that Baswati rice has a lower glycemic index compared to other white rice. So one day I had lunch at a restaurant called Flame Broiler. So I had grilled chicken, steamed vegetables, and white rice. And my blood glucose spiked to 190 just an hour after the meal, which really surprised me. In contrast, when I have my meals at home, I use basmati rice, which has a much lower glycemic index, and it would only take my blood glucose to about 140. So as many of you know, I'm a big fan of basmati rice. It's easy to digest, it has no lectins, and it has a much lower glycemic index compared to other white rice. So I actually grew up in Hawaii, where sticky short grain white rice was actually really popular. But it turns out that sticky white rice is essentially like eating cotton candy when it comes to your blood sugar. Lesson number three is that certain breads turn immediately into sugar. So one day I had lunch at a Greek restaurant. I had avgalomono soup, which is a lemon chicken soup, and a salad with some roasted peppers and feta cheese. And there were two tiny pieces of white bread on the plate, which I also ate. My glucose an hour later was at 185, which again was a big surprise, and it was all because of the bread. Now in contrast, when I have bread at home, I use Ezekiel bread, which is a flourless bread made with sprouted whole grains, so it has a much lower glycemic index. And usually this bread doesn't spike my glucose at all. Also, pairing your bread with a fat can make a big difference. So typically for breakfast, I'll have an Ezekiel toast with some goat butter and an egg along with some berries. And that only takes my blood glucose to about 120. So thereafter, whenever I'd eat in a restaurant and there was bread on the table, I would still enjoy a little bit, but I would always pair it with some fat, whether it was butter or olive oil. And by doing this, I was able to avoid significant glucose spikes. And many of you may also like to pair avocado with your bread, which is another really healthy fat. So avocado toast is another great way to avoid spiking your blood sugar. Lesson number four is that the order in which you eat your food matters. So if you eat a carb first, you're immediately going to spike your blood glucose. Whereas if you have protein, fat, and fiber first, and then save your carb for last, then you're going to have a lot more stable blood sugar. So an example is when I would go out for breakfast on the weekends, I would have an omelet first, then some fruit, and I would save my toast with butter for last, and my glucose would stay under 140. Now let me give you an example of something you want to avoid doing. So you definitely don't want to start your meal with orange juice, because that will immediately spike your blood sugar, followed by toast with jam, which is even more carbs, and then even if you have scrambled eggs at the end, which has protein, it's too late your blood glucose will already be quite high. 
Lesson number five is that your glucose reflects net carbs in your meal. So how do you calculate net carbs? So net carbs is the total grams of carbohydrate in the meal minus the grams of fiber. So two meals could actually taste quite similar, but be completely different when it comes to net carbs. So for example, I recently discovered palmini noodles, which are made from a vegetable called hearts of palm. So they're really low in carbs, but rich in fiber. So they're a great alternative to traditional pasta noodles. So let's compare the net carbs in these two meals. On the left, we have spaghetti and meatballs in a restaurant, which will have over 50 grams of net carbs and very little fiber. And on the right, this is actually a meal I made at home. So it's palmini and meatballs, and it has less than 10 grams of net carbs and plenty of fiber. So spaghetti and meatballs would spike your blood glucose to the 180s or 190s, whereas palmini and meatballs would keep your blood glucose well under 140. So the key to losing belly fat and losing weight is to reduce your net carbs per day. Tracking your net carbs can be helpful, and you can use a free app like MyFitnessPal. Now, most Americans eat over 300 grams of net carbs per day, which is a lot. So you could gradually try to reduce this to like 150, then to 100, and then even 50. And you should see positive changes in your body composition, meaning you should be trimming down fat. Now, if you get your net carbs down to 20 per day, which is pretty low, after a few days, you will be in ketosis. And this can really accelerate fat loss. And a lot of people feel great in ketosis. They have more energy and better mental clarity. So if you'd like to learn more about the keto diet, please check out my video on this topic. Lesson number six is that pureed fruit versus whole fruit impact blood glucose differently. So one night I had unsweetened applesauce after dinner as my dessert. And I was surprised to see that my blood glucose went up to 149. But when you think about applesauce, it has the peel removed and it's pureed. So your body can just really quickly absorb it. In contrast, an apple in its whole form has the peel. And your stomach has to first break it down before absorption can take place in the small intestine. So this really lowers the glycemic index. This is also why you need to be careful with fruit smoothies. Because if you don't balance it with protein, fat, and fiber, it could spike your blood glucose. So that's why I always recommend adding a protein powder to your fruit smoothie. And my favorite is collagen with hyaluronic acid. So this is also great for hair, skin, and nails, as well as your joints. You could also add in some healthy fats like walnuts or even olive oil. And for fiber, you could add some leafy greens, chia seeds, flax seeds, or hemp seeds. Lesson number seven is that rest and sleep lower your blood glucose. So when I would rest on the couch or take a nap, my blood glucose would drop sometimes to the 70s. And at night, my blood glucose would drop sometimes below 70s. And I was completely unaware of it. I also noticed that the pattern of glucose at night would be in waves matching the sleep cycles. So it's kind of like hibernation and your body is actually reserving its energy stores while you're resting. Also, while you're sleeping, you're lowering your cortisol levels. Now, for some people, low blood glucose in the middle of the night could cause an awakening and even hot flashes. Fortunately, I didn't seem to be aware of the low blood glucose in the middle of the night. Initially, I thought maybe I should have a bedtime snack to prevent those low blood sugar levels. But as it turns out, the less I eat before bed, the better the quality of my sleep. Lesson number eight is that exercise could increase or decrease your blood glucose. So one day, I rode my Peloton bike for 20 minutes first thing in the morning in a fasted state. And after that, I thought to myself, I should do some strength training. So I started to lift some weights, but after just one set, I felt really fatigued and worn out. So I stopped and looked at my glucose and saw that it had dropped to 69. So everyone has a different response to exercise. Sometimes during exercise, your blood glucose actually goes up because you're breaking down your glycogen stores in your muscles and releasing the glucose due to the rise in adrenaline and cortisol. Other times, the glucose utilization by your muscles could cause your blood glucose to drop, especially if you're fasting or on a low-carb diet. So it's really important to listen to your body. 
But as a whole, exercise is excellent for improving your overall glucose control because it helps open up your insulin receptors, helping with insulin resistance. And it can also help you to increase your muscle mass, which will increase your insulin sensitivity. Lesson number nine is that acute glucose drops can trigger more hunger. So when I ate a higher carb meal and my blood glucose was on its way back down to the 80s, I immediately felt like I needed to eat again, even though I just eaten an hour before. And I would start craving something sweet, like a treat. So your body really doesn't like a rapid drop in blood glucose and it makes your brain think that you need to eat again. So if you want to get your hunger under control, you really want to avoid sudden glucose spikes, which are then followed by sudden glucose drops. Lesson number 10 is that small indulgences like dark chocolate can be okay. So certain dark chocolates are really not that bad when it comes to your blood glucose. So my favorite chocolate would take my blood glucose from the 80s to 110, which is not bad. So this is my favorite chocolate. It's called Cacao Bella Chocolate, and each square only has 5 grams of sugar. So what makes this chocolate unique is it also has 2 grams of varicel collagen, which is really good for your skin, hair, and nails. And I believe that this collagen helps to lower the glycemic index of this chocolate. And this chocolate offers a lot of other benefits. So each square has 4 grams of astaxanthin, which is a powerful antioxidant that can help protect your skin from solar radiation. It also contains high-quality cacao, which offers antioxidant flavonoids, which is good for cardiovascular health. So this is one of my favorite treats that I've been enjoying every day this year. And unlike other chocolates, I really feel the anti-inflammatory benefits of this chocolate. And I've noticed it really enhances my mental focus and my mood as well. So if you'd like to try some of this amazing Cacao Bella chocolate, I put a link in the description below and a coupon code so you can get 10% off your order. Now what can you do if your blood glucose is running high after a meal? Well, an easy thing to do is to go for a little walk because that's going to allow glucose utilization by your muscles and that can help lower your blood glucose. Next, my two favorite supplements to naturally improve blood glucose are Berberine Pro and Cinnamon and Chromium. So Berberine comes from the root of the Berberine plant and it works to naturally activate your insulin receptors to improve your blood glucose. It's also very anti-inflammatory and it has antimicrobial effects to kill bad bacteria and yeast in the gut microbiome. Cinnamon and chromium also work to activate insulin receptors. In my practice, I've seen amazing results using these two supplements to help my patients who have prediabetes and diabetes. So it helps improve their fasting glucose, their fasting insulin, and their hemoglobin A1c. And many of my patients who don't even have insulin resistance still use berberine to optimize their metabolism, their cholesterol, and improve their gut microbiome health. And berberine is actually one of my personal favorites that I take every day. So if you're curious about how food, exercise, or stress affects your blood glucose, try a CGM for yourself because knowing your numbers can help change your life. So let me know in the comments below if you've ever used a CGM before or what surprised you most from my experience. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And be sure to watch this video next for a complete guide on how to reverse insulin resistance.